Fascism is nothing to be trivial about. It is a existential threat to humanity. All that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. That House Freedom Caucus is a cancerous caucus within the House of Representatives that will, in the next two years, do damage to our democracy. And I don't know if the democratic forces are strong enough to stop it. That is a very dangerous institution of fascism in America today. We need to organize, we need to share, we need to lock arms and take on this great evil that is confronting us. Welcome to episode 144 of the Refuse Fascism podcast, a podcast brought to you by volunteers with Refuse Fascism. I'm Sam Goldman, one of those volunteers and host of the show. Refuse Fascism exposes, analyzes, and stands against the very real danger and threat of fascism coming to power in the United States. In today's episode, we bring on a regular listener of the show, Werner Lang, a retired educator and pastor and author of Onward Christian Soldiers, The MAGA March Toward a Fascist America, to discuss his recent essay, A Lesson for America 90 Years After Hitler's Ascension to Power. Then we share an encore interview from way back in season one, October 31st, 2020 of this show. We're giving listeners a chance to hear an excerpt of the interview we did with Andrea Chalupa, co-host of Gaslit Nation. We talk about taking the streets and how that challenges a dictator's legitimacy. But first, thanks to everyone who goes the extra step and rates and reviews the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever they listen. Here is one from this past week titled Anti-Fascist Analysis from U.S. and International. From Aces Places, who gives the show five stars and writes, quote, every time I listen, I become more convinced that fascism isn't on our doorstep here in the U.S. It's in the entry hall. Listen yourself and you'll get a lot to think about. The wide-ranging guests bring light from many angles. This is a relevant and necessary podcast, end quote. Thanks, Aces Places. If you appreciate the show and want to help us reach more people who want to refuse fascism, be a gem and go write a review and drop five stars wherever you listen to your pods. Please tell the people out there in podcast land why you listen and they should too. Of course, subscribe, follow so you never miss an episode. We need to talk about how the fascist threat has grown and shown itself this past week. Trump escalated the already horrific attack on our trans siblings via a four-minute genocidal video on Truth Social, a full-scale war on transgender folks and the healthcare community who serve them. I felt that Brandon Wolf, a survivor of the Pulse nightclub attack, put it well when he tweeted, quote, Donald Trump's transphobia at a fever pitch as he rattles off every lever of government he would wield, every freedom he would torch to punish transgender people for daring to exist and their allies for daring to affirm them, end quote. The danger cannot be overstated and how this further unleashes violence against trans folks, emboldens more anti-trans legislation at the state level, throws the gauntlet down for others to meet or beat his brutality. As of recording, state lawmakers have introduced 200 anti-trans bills, more than all of those introduced in 2022. In case you forgot, it is only the first week of February. In Utah, a ban on gender-affirming care for minors is already in effect, with devastating consequences. On the same House floor where members of the GOP are proudly wearing AR-15 pins, the GOP ousted Representative Ilan Omar of Minnesota from the Foreign Affairs Committee, allegedly over previous comments on Israel. Reality doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that Omar co-sponsored a resolution that condemned anti-Semitism and recognized, quote-unquote, Israel as America's legitimate and democratic ally. It doesn't matter that the GOP traffics perpetual anti-Semitism and collaborates with Holocaust deniers and defenders. Reality doesn't matter here. But we should know what this really is. And we should not turn away from the fact that this removal, this ousting of Omar, is the latest act of political revenge. 
this time revenge for the removal of Gosar and Green from their committee last term for inciting and promoting political violence. We should also note that this is only their beginning. For those relying on the goodness of institutions to be the guardrails to the fascist danger, please see how the college board completely caved to Ron DeSantis. The college board, the not-for-profit organization that oversees the SATs and AP courses across the U.S., has taken the fascist baton from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, doubling down on his anti-Black racism and adding a whole new level of anti-intellectualism with nationwide effect. You might recall that the state of Florida rejected the AP Black History curriculum proposed by the College Board as having no educational value and being a tool for left-wing indoctrination. Did this esteemed institution of learning stand up to this attack? No. They stripped their curriculum of not only the contested mention of quote-unquote critical race theory, but of theory of any kind. According to the New York Times, David Coleman, the head of the college board, said that during the initial test of the school course this year, the board received feedback that the secondary, more theoretical sources were quote-unquote quite dense and that students connected more with primary sources, which he said have always been the foundation of AP courses. He went on to say, quote, We experimented with lots of things, including assigning secondary courses, and we found a lot of issues arose as we did. I think what is most surprising and powerful for most people is looking directly at people's experience, end quote. To remind our listeners, we're talking about advanced placement courses. Over hundreds of years, millions of Africans were violently seized from their homelands and dragged to the Americas. Through the course of that and all the events that followed and were shaped by it, people have dreamed and envisioned a better life and often a whole better world analyzed why and how this world is the way it is, how it can be so cruel and so beautiful and everything in between, imagined and strategized over how to get free, debated and discussed and argued over all of this. But according to the College Board, all of this is just quote-unquote secondary sources. This anti-intellectualism is all too common in our society. One more factor, priming our society for fascism. But to see it so clearly articulated and weaponized from no less than the College Board itself is astounding. I encourage you to listen to our episodes with Frederico Finkelstein, where we discuss fascism's need to decimate critical thinking throughout society. The AR-15 pins this week, the Islamophobia, the anti-socialism, racism, and anti-intellectualism straight from the college board. Fascism is trending pretty hard right now. It's important to call it what it is. Each of these actions give someone or many someones the opportunity to disrupt, to say no, to call it what it is and refuse fascism. What will you do when that someone is you? And we can't go on to the interview without touching on the continued assault on abortion rights and the war on women. We wanted to highlight just a couple stories that were buried, if not entirely omitted, by the mainstream media. The RNC pledges to, quote, go on offensive in the 2024 election cycle, end quote, on abortion and, quote, pass the strongest pro-life legislation possible, end quote. Right now looming over the post roll hellscape of legal abortion access in the United States is a federal case that could result in what experts have characterized as a nationwide ban on medication abortion. Preventing patients from gaining medication abortion from any pharmacy or provider. Medication abortion is the most common way that people terminate pregnancies, and the medications have been on the market for over two decades, providing safe and effective abortions. The decision whether to keep Mifepristone accessible is now up to a federal judge in Texas. And in case you were unsure, yes, he is a Trump appointee. And yes, he is a longtime Christian fascist with a track record to prove it. Jenny Ma, senior counsel for Center for Reproductive Rights, shared the significance of this case, stating, quote, this would be one court in Texas deciding whether or not medication abortion could be allowed across this country, even in states that have protected abortion since the Dobbs decision, end quote. Women's March has called for emergency mobilization in Amarillo, Texas, on February 11th to defend the threat of a nationwide ban on medication abortion. The Christian fascists aren't waiting idly for a decision. 20 Republican state attorney generals sent a letter to CVS and Walgreens warning them that mailing abortion medication to their states would be against the law. If they're able to keep abortion medication out of their states, not only would it mean that women wouldn't have access to the most common form of abortion, but it would also mean that those having miscarriages wouldn't be able to obtain the medication. Such a medication is a standard treatment in miscarriage care. 
Yesterday, there was a nationwide day of protests around pharmacy chains who carry abortion medications. As Carrie Baker reported for Ms. Magazine, they targeted, quote, pharmacies that have announced plans to offer abortion pills, including Walgreens, CVS, and Rite Aid. The protests are organized by the so-called Progressive Anti-Abortion Uprising, PAAU, a group that claims to be peaceful and progressive, but whose members have repeatedly broken the law to achieve their goal of intimidating, harassing, and blocking women from accessing reproductive health care, end quote. We will be, as always, continuing to cover this story and look forward to hearing from you as well on ways that you are taking action to rise up for abortion rights. With that, now here's my conversation with Werner. I am happy to welcome on Werner Lang, a retired educator and pastor who was born in the rubble that was Germany after the fascists got through the Vaterland. He is chair of the Ohio Peace Council and author of Onward Christian Soldiers, The MAGA March Toward a Fascist America. Welcome, Werner. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So you recently wrote a piece titled A Lesson for America, 90 Years After Hitler's Ascension to Power. And in it, you stated, quote, there is an alarming lesson in this disastrous historic development for a deeply divided America today, cutting deals with fascists to catapult a voraciously power hungry politician to high national office places a nation in grave peril, end quote. And I was hoping you could talk to us more about what this lesson is and and the moment that we're in right now. First of all, to go back to that disaster that took place 90 years ago on January the 30th, I hope listeners and generally the public know that Hitler was never elected to that position. He was installed in that position by big business in Germany at the time, the bankers and some of the more powerful industrialists that were nervous over a growing movement toward socialism in the last free election before the Nazis took over. The Nazi party lost some seats in parliament and the Communist Party gained some seats. So the pendulum was swinging to the left and these industrialists were very nervous about the direction and they basically had Hitler installed as the kanzler, as the chancellor, to stop the movement to the left. Now, I find some parallels to that here in our present situation. In this January, we also had a lot of contentious dialogue going on between the powers that be in Congress that allowed then for McCarthy to be catapulted into his position as Speaker. And it occurs to me that this was probably the result of the ruling class in our country calling in its chips and finally demanding a return on its investment. In that sense, it has a similarity, although not a a complete one, to what happened in Germany. And that is that basically behind this move to the right, behind this corruption, was the force of big business, the most reactionary, the most racist forms of the ruling class in our society. Also, like happened in Germany, looking towards the right and leaders on the the right to protect them from the growing populist movement, which is continuing here in our country on the left, but it needs to get much, much stronger. You had spoken in the article and in your conversation just now about how your personal experience shapes how you see this danger and the need to sound the alarm. And I was wondering if you could speak more about that. Well, if this installation of Hitler and this power grab by the fascists never took place, I and my family would probably be continuing to live in Germany in peace And there will be at least 50 million more people alive that were consumed in the flames of uh, World War II. Fascism is nothing to be trivial about. It is an existential threat to humanity. And as the sign that is not legible behind me says, in the name of humanity, we refuse to have a fascist America. And that, I think, is uh, number one on the agenda overall in what we are doing now in our times, that we have to avert this reality so that we don't fail to learn from the mistakes of the past. 
my family came from what is known as the Volksdeutsche. They were the second class Germans, the ones that lived in German speaking communities in Poland and in Russia for centuries. We were not the Reichsdeutsche. And so this catastrophe also destroyed that long legacy of our farming in that part of the world and created war refugees for us and for our family, which we were, and then eventually arriving in America as we were called DPs at the time, displaced persons in the early 1950s. And uh, as a result of those experiences and a result of the very good education that I've received, I became a committed anti-fascist early in my life and remained so. I just never thought growing up in the 60s and being a child of the 60s and all of those great progressive movements that 50, 60 years later, we would be in the situation that we are in now. I thought we would have a socialist America by now. And I still am hoping and working towards that goal. When you think about the decent people of this country, in their hearts, most people have the same sentiment that you do, that this is not a direction that we want to go in. And yet there is inaction or there's complacency or this is just the way it is mentality. I don't need to worry about it. I just have to focus on my life. There's a lot of dynamics at play. What do you think is most important right now in helping people recognize the situation we're in? What are people not getting that they need to get in this moment? That's a good question and not an easy one to answer. There is an endemic of false consciousness, as I would call it, of people not knowing really who their friends and their enemies are in this uh, struggle for ongoing and qualitatively improved democracy. And that is certainly true among the evangelical Christian right that there is a complete lack of understanding of what really Christianity is about, and also in many ways what America and democracy are all about. I don't know if there is any one thing that could finally wake up the sleeping giant of the good people of America, but whatever it is, I hope it happens soon because that was, of course, one of the problems of the rise of fascism in Germany. Fascism is always a dictatorship, so it's not really the will of the people, of course, that created. It's imposed upon them, and many realize much too late what a monster has been given a life by the inaction. But as one said very wisely long ago, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And the bulk of the American population is very good in terms of its moral bearing and its general outlook. It's just that they have been manipulated by masters of deceit, let's call them, and fascists are excellent masters of deceit and have them fall into the trap of following a wolf in sheep's clothing rather than recognizing by the actions that are done and the ideology that is announced how absolutely evil the goals and intentions are. I just think that we need really a great awakening of the spirit of enlightenment. I think really education plays a very, very important role in this. And that's why the far right is so hell-bent upon destroying quality public education. They recognize the danger of people coming from the working class, coming from the margins, coming from low-income Americans, getting a good education education and thereby recognizing very clearly what needs to be done to change the situation and having the courage to do it. I am optimistic that we will not repeat the disaster that happened 90 years ago in my homeland at that time, but that the true spirit of America, which has come out over and over again in breaking through the forces of tyranny, first in the foundation of the country, and then in the second American Revolution with the abolition of slavery, and then the powerful movements in progress of the 1960s, and they are still there now. It's just that we face a uh, growing organization
organizational problem. The left is not organized strong enough. The Christian left, for instance, is very weak compared to the Christian right. Labor unions are much weaker today than they have been in the past. Progressive political movements are splintered, also generally weak. If something, if not to this threat of the MAGA movement, something like it needs to unite all these disparate parts and awaken them into a united front against fascism. It would be an absolute disaster if there was greater power achieved in the next election and certainly in 2024 by the fascist elements and by the MAGA movement. It's my hope that with the United Front against fascism, the MAGA movement will be put to rest and it will join the dust heap of history, just like the KKK and other fascist movements did. What would that look like for people to imagine? What would it look like for there to be, you know, using your words, a united front against fascism? What would that look like? Well, it would look like the anti-Vietnam movements in the 60s. It would look like the women's movement in the 60s. It would look like the civil rights movement in the 60s. It would look like America, the beautiful, finally arising against America, the ugly, and saying, no, you shall not pass here. And it comes, I think, with focusing upon certain issues. One of the great galvanizing forces, I think, within the past year has been the abortion issue. The fact that this fundamental constitutional right of some 50 or more years has been just ripped away, basically, from the American public is something that I think played a large role in preventing the red wave, which was predicted of 2022, that there was only a modest victory, but not a overwhelming one. And now I think also the environmental movement, climate change, also the growing threat of world war emanating out of the Iran conflict and also the desperate need we have in our country for a national health care. We're the only one that doesn't have them. There was just a report out that we spend much, much more on health care than any other country, but we have results that are abysmal, that make us look like a third world country. These things, I think, are points, health care, the environment, abortion, war threatening, that can galvanize the movement in this year and in the coming years, as strong as the movements in the 1960s that changed America, but not sufficiently because they decapitated our leaders. They killed JFK and then Malcolm and then RFK and then MLK. And the forces behind that have never been brought to justice. You've written a book that is now two years old, yes. you know, a really sounding the alarm on what we, you and I call the Christian fascist threat, which has been euphemized in many different ways to uh, the Christian right or those kind of phrases that kind of sanitize, if you will, the danger that they pose. And for listeners, it delves into the nature of this MAGA movement, which is a fascist movement and has a deep component of Christian fascism as its most loyal and organized core that brought it to power, that helped maintain its power. It's being the Trump-Pence nightmare regime. One of the things that the book gets at is the qualitative shift, the difference, how this is something new and yet ongoing, and what the danger this movement poses. And it's really aimed at getting people to sound the alarm and wake up and say, hey, this is something we need to respond to. And I was wondering how you view the threat now, two years later, what has changed in your thinking, if anything, since you've written it, kind of just reflecting on the research that you did and where we are now. First of all, you and I have been using the phrase Christian fascism. You don't hear that in uh, the corporate media. You don't even hear that on the left, for the most part. At the very most, they say Christian nationalists or far-right Christians or the Christian right. I think one step in that direction of enlightenment is calling this force what it is. It's Christian fascism, which of course is an oxymoron, because you can't be a Christian and fascist at the same time. You can't even be a fascist and a Christian at the same time. But nevertheless, you got to name your demons correctly. And I, I think that that's part of it. And one thing that has been and I think also largely overlooked 
is the ideology of the end times. I'm not sure that everybody is aware of the madness uh, that is incorporated at the heart of the Christian fascist movement, that basically the uh, idea that in the end times there will be this great world war, and it's a good thing that it is there, and it's going to take place in uh, the Middle East, in the Holy Land, uh, Israel, Armageddon. And even what's happening now, right now, in uh, Palestine and Israel, is something that is cheering on the Christian fascists. They say, this is all supposed to happen in God's plan, that we have this war, that we have this uh, enormous slaughter of people, because this is the way that we have the second coming of Christ, which was equated with the second coming of Trump in 2020 for so many people. I think we also need to uncover not only the fact that this movement is basically a fascist movement, not just simply nationalist or right wing, but that it has at its heart the invitation to World War III in the Holy Land and working anxiously towards that goal. And there are a number of Christian Zionists that are behind this, and the number is increasing. There was, and almost no coverage was given to this, a major event in the fall of 2020, it was on September the 26th, to be exact, called The Return, a National and Global Day of Prayer and Repentance. And I covered that in my book to a certain extent. And if you listen to what was being said there by the 60 or so main speakers, it was basically a call to war a call to war, and the fact that the 250,000 that were assembled there were all warriors for God in this end-time movement. And I encourage people to become aware of this ongoing organized group called The Return. They're holding events in Africa and I believe the Middle East, uh, maybe even this year. And this is an ongoing movement that is also part of the Christian fascist movement that has very specific goals, and peace is not one of them. This idea in fascism about the pure and the impure, about the chosen and the unchosen, about the damned and the blessed, and uh, you have that very deeply ingrained, this type of a bifurcation of a mentality between the good and the evil in the mindset of the Christian fascists, that they, of course, are the good ones. And any liberal, let alone socialist or communist, is the embodiment of evil, deserving not only containment, but annihilation. One thing that disturbed me, and I hope this is not a harbinger of things to come, is what happened in Arizona, that one of these fascists took it upon themselves to shoot the homes of Democrats as a way of dealing with so-called liberalism. That is a very clear sign of fascism. And you asked about what has changed since I put this book together rather quickly, by the way, in early 2021. And so far, what has changed is, number one, the good we didn't reelect Trump in this MAGA movement, but that was by the skin of our teeth. He still got 10 million more votes even after the fascist putsch attempt than he did in 2016. But he didn't have the red wave. That is the good thing. And I really attribute that also to the progressive core in the African-American community, because what happened there in Georgia with the victory of Womack gave us the majority in the Senate. And I think also another positive move was the growing abortion rights movement that stopped many of these right-wing ideologues from winning at the state and at the local, if not the national level. But the bad thing about all of this is now the MAGA movement basically is stronger than ever. And the worst thing about it, it has now a very, very strong foothold in the House of Representatives. That House Freedom Caucus, as I mentioned in the article, is a mini Nazi party. I don't say that lightly. That is a cancerous caucus within the House of Representatives that will, in the next two years, 
do damage to our democracy. And I don't know if the democratic forces are strong enough to stop it. And we have just about all of the Republicans falling lockstep into anything that they come up with, as they did with all of the deals. And we don't know how many there were that were cut to get McCarthy the House. But I think that is a very dangerous institutionalization of fascism in America today. We have not had that before. This is new and it's dangerous. Yeah. And I just wanted to add that you have that in the House of Representatives, which we talked in last week's episode a lot about and the danger that they pose. And then you have these state houses across the country where these Christian fascists have really consolidating power, where you have whole states that really are under fascist domination at this point. Looking at you, Florida, Texas, where all the institutions almost have been taken over. And then they're the model for what's being aimed nationwide. When I think about what happens with this Christian fascist movement, there's this thing every couple of years, there's different phrases and different things that people say, they're done, they're over. They went too far and now they're done. The Christian fascists are done. They don't say Christian fascists because they won't use the word, but people will popular be like, the Christian right went just too far. Yeah. And the latest is they went just too far with Roe. They went too far and yet they're still able to go further and they still have power. The fact that the Christian fascists went after abortion isn't stopping them from now having a Trump appointed judge oversee whether medication abortion is going to stay on the books. We have the purging of libraries in state after state because you have Christian fascists, not just on school boards, but you have them in the Department of Education. You have them in the governor's mansion. You have them everywhere, and they are following deeply patriarchal doctrines to decide what stays and what goes on shelves. The tsunami of anti-transgender bills banning gender-affirming care, I think it's now up to 150 bills that have been proposed in 25 states just this year. It is mind-boggling how... Folks cannot see the genocidal implications of the Christian fascists. Before we close out the conversation, I wanted to see if there was anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to speak to, anything that's burning on your mind that you want to make sure that listeners hear. Well, this is the beginning of Black History Month, and I think all white Americans should celebrate Black History Month, and especially in times like this when the critical race theory is under such vicious attack, we need to stand up and say, no, we will not have lies replace the truth about uh, our history. And that reminds me then of a uh, statement by a great African-American scholar who I, I admire very much, W.E.B. Du Bois, whose birthday, 155th anniversary is later this month, who way back in the middle of Jim Crow said, either the United States will destroy ignorance or ignorance will destroy the United States. Right now, it's a toss up. And I think that that's a perfect place to close out. I want to thank you, Werner, for giving us a lot to think about and sharing your perspective, your expertise, your insights with us, and of course, your time. And where should people go to find more from you? First of all, you can get a copy of the book that was mentioned, Onward Christian Soldiers. It's in Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing. Or you can also just email me, wlang912 at gmail.com, W-L-A-N-G-E 912 at uh, gmail.com. We need to organize, we need to share, we need to lock arms and take on this great evil that is confronting us. I have 12 grandchildren. They need a future. So true. So true. They do. Thank Thank you. you again, Werner. We want to shout out the Organization of American Historians for their statement denouncing the Florida Department of Education's decision to reject AP African American Studies, leading to decisions to strip scholarship from the curriculum. In their statement, they write, quote, vibrant democratic societies are not built upon a foundation of selective depictions of the past, but rather demand critical examination of and grappling with the historical record, end quote. We've linked to their statement in the show notes, along with an open letter in defense of AP African American Studies. This letter was signed by 600 scholars of African American Studies, including members of the Organization of American Historians. Next, 
we're sharing an interview with Andrea Chalupa that originally aired on October 31st, 2020. I was re-listening and thought the way that Andrea described Trump and the context of fascism and genocide with deep roots in this nation's history was clarifying and has renewed relevance. Give it a listen. I have been listening to Gaslight Nation for several years now. It's been since 2018, I guess, is when I started. Yes, 2018. We launched right, I think, after the news of the kids in cages was coming out, I believe. And even though that horrendous policy was started from the get-go, like as soon as they got in, they were just like, you know, release the Nazis, you know? So we launched heading into the midterms to give people a space to come together and stay engaged in what really mattered. It's such a beautiful thing. And it's been a lifeline for so many people. You have been exposing Trump, his regime, and sounding the alarm about how dire the situation truly is for years. I think one of the things that is worth exploring is... In the U.S., any blatantly what I would call fascist movement, you may use the word authoritarianism for the context of this conversation. I don't think that the definition is the most essential is going to have genocidal underpinnings given the history of this country, a country built on genocide, slavery. How do you see Trump in relation to that history? Oh, dear Um, God. He's an extension. (laughs) And yes, what do you see him calling forth? Well, so Donald Trump is very clearly an extension of the genocide that built America, the, the massive genocide of Native Americans, which was so great, so horrific that it literally changed the global climate on the mm-hmm. planet. And of course, the hundreds of years of the Holocaust of slavery. And it was the white people and the complicit black and brown people that try to hide in that system for their own protection and were complicit in it. It was that system of white supremacy that to this day is what we're up against. That is it. That is what's central to the work that we're doing. That's why it's so important to protect the most vulnerable among us and to undo white supremacy and just to be relentless in doing that. There's a reason why Donald Trump has put up a portrait to Andrew Jackson, bloody, bloody Jackson. And that's because he believes in the ideology of white supremacy. There was a report that he kept a book of Hitler's speeches in his bedroom, that he read it, that he studied it. And you see that in how he loves his rallies and how he works his rallies. Mm. And so I think, obviously, if he he manages to steal this election, as as he's been trying desperately to do for a while now, he got impeached trying to essentially steal the election. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to see is the camps, the camp system they built up on the border filling up. I think you're going to see a ratcheting up of harassment, including legal harassment, financial harassment against journalists and activists, whistleblowers. We've seen some of that the last four years, but I think it's going to be a lot more aggressive. I do believe we will have show trials. And if anyone thinks that that is insane to say we're going to have show trials in the United States, look at the movie, The Trial of the Chicago 7. Look at the documentary on the Chicago 7. That was a show trial by Richard Nixon of anti-Vietnam War activists. So we've had show trials in America. A lot of cases against Black people, especially in Jim Crow South, were the equivalent of show trials. And because they're already considered guilty and and, and they were just displays of white power, essentially. So I think a lot of white people in America that are clutching their pearls and thinking, like, how could this be happening? How is this happening? Don't understand that this has always been happening. And I think silver lining of where we are today is the fact that a lot of people are waking up to the fact that this is our country and that we were born into fascism here in the United States and that people of privilege can no longer keep their eyes closed to it or be oblivious to it because it's impacting us now. Like when you have the coronavirus killing nearly a quarter of a million people in America, that's a lot of white people that have been impacted. And as they're paying attention to this virus, they're seeing that it's killing, you know, in all the news reports, we're all like breathlessly following. We're seeing all of the racial inequality and income inequality that's being exposed with the horrendous death tolls of black and brown people in America from coronavirus. And that that was part of what that and George Floyd is what fueled a lot of those Black Lives Matter protests that we saw in the spring. 
And so you finally have white people understanding full well what white supremacy is because they too now are threatened by it with Donald Trump and power and all his abuses of power and all the corruption and all the environmental protections he's rolling back and how he's destroying our country deliberately from within. So I think we are at a tipping point moment where you do have larger and larger numbers of white people waking up to white supremacy, how it works and why it must be dismantled if you want to protect everybody. It's a really important point about what you're getting at in terms of the the ingredients that that exists, both in terms of the white supremacy at the core of it, but also on the flip side, the, the ingredients that people have at their disposal to see the direction that this could go, because the evidence is is so ample, should people confront it. I think that given how this country was formed and since its inception and and, and onward, there have been the basis for fascism to take hold here. And with Trump, I think that we see what is a slow genocide in many ways, mm-hmm. very quickly becoming a fast genocide. Yes. And one of the challenges that I've faced, and I know others have too, in getting people to come to terms with the growth of fascist movements in this country and fascists now currently in power is this American exceptionalism, the idea that fascism is a foreign thing to the U.S., that the Nazi Germany was something that was a horrific aberration unique only to Germany in the 20th century, and that something like that could never take hold in our country. Yesterday or the day before, Jeff Charlotte tweeted out a really powerful thread of analysis of how the Blue Lives Matter flag has replaced the American flag Mm -hmm. um, as the official flag at Trump rallies, really visually illustrating the fascist remaking of their movement. And I'm just wondering, what do you say to people who have this notion that what we saw in Nazi Germany could only happen in, in Germany at that time in history and could never happen here? Well, anybody that thinks that needs to be reminded that it could have very well happened in the United States in the 1930s. You had all-American hero, Charles Lindbergh, the Brett Favre, <laughs> the Brett Favre of his day. I'm just kidding. Because um, Brett Favre just endorsed Trump. Um, so you, you had Charles Lindbergh, right? The great aviator hero who wrote in Reader's Digest, mainstream all-American Reader's Digest, a 1939 essay saying that in order to keep America great, we must keep America white. You, of course, had Nazi rallies in the United States during the rise of Hitler. You had Joe Kennedy, the ambassador, the United States ambassador to the UK in London, you know, sending reports back to FDR saying that the United Kingdom was going to fall to fascism. It was just a matter of time that the UK was going to align with Hitler and that we just had to get used to it. And that's the way the wind was blowing. The world was headed to fascism. And that's that's fine. That's absolutely perfectly acceptable. Joe Kennedy, JFK's dad, was staunchly on the side of Hitler and the fascists. And this created a lot of tension with between him, FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt at the time. And so I want to emphasize that again, Joe Kennedy, the father of JFK and RFK, was on the side of Hitler and was telling his president, FDR, to prepare for fascism, to prepare for fascism being you know, the prevailing wind during that time and, and not doing it in an alarmist way, but saying, well, Hitler won. We've got to get used to this new Hitler world order. Like he was doing it in a very pragmatic way. And you have to wonder, like, you don't have to wonder because it's well documented, but you have to understand that uh, that this whole um, welcome mat that a lot of uh, elites in the West rolled out for Hitler, it was here in the US too. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just Chamberlain trying to appease Hitler. It was a lot of Western elites that thought that Hitler said what most people were afraid to say. And that's not unique to America. That's not unique to Great Britain. That's not unique to Germany. That can exist and take root anywhere around the world. I learned a lot from that. (laughs) I didn't know all of those things about Kennedy. Yeah. In my work doing grassroots organizing and outreach to many people troubled by Trump, one phenomena I've encountered again and again and again is people who really thought that the institutions were going to save us, particularly through the Mueller investigation and then the very narrowly focused impeachment hearings. Within Refuse Fascism, we've always struggled to place the primary emphasis 
on the fascist character of this regime and the fact that the normal channels are not adequate to stop them, that we need a mass movement in the streets focused on what's fully at stake for immigrants, for women, for Black people, for the environment, for all the people in the crosshairs of a fully consolidated fascist regime in the United States. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that sort of faith in the institutions and whether you've evolved your own understanding of the various normalization and enabling that has happened by these institutions and what you would say to someone who has told us over the past four years that we don't need a mass movement to oust Trump now at this late hour. It was what I said before. Everything comes down to human nature. We're up against people. Institutions are made of people. The institutions aren't like a dam that was built and the, the waves of fascism are crossing against the steel of the dam. There is no steel in our institutions. They're human mm. beings and they're human beings that can be bought. They're human beings that can be intimidated. They're human beings that can be fired for doing their jobs. And that's essentially what we've seen. We've seen a rapid purge. We've definitely seen an out in the open purge of our intelligence community. All the, you know, all the times Trump was tweeting about Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and Bruce Orr and, and Bruce Orr's wife and, and others, that was open obstruction of justice. He was harassing the investigators. He was putting their lives in danger. And he was purging our, our government throughout. And he just passed an executive order demanding loyalty from civil servants, the bureaucrats that make up um, our institutions. And this is playbook fascism, where he's making sure that he cannot be checked, his powers cannot be checked, and that he is the state. Donald Trump is the state now. That's where we are. So we, we're certainly not going to survive four more years of this or else it's going to just set us back for a very long time. And, and I don't know how we would claw our way out without mass mobilization. Mass mobilization is, should always be there in, in the best of times and the worst of times. Mass mobilization is essential. And what it's so good at doing is hitting the dictator where it hurts. As I said earlier, a dictator, fascism, is ego unleashed. And what these guys crave is legitimacy. That's why they often do their crimes within the rule of law. They want to be legitimate. That's why they held the Republican National Convention on the White House lawn. They wanted that photo op, the propaganda of the White House in the background to show their power, show their le legitimacy. We are the White House. We are the United States. You're not going to get rid of us. We're here to stay. And so when people show up in the streets, thousands of people, even a handful of people in, in a red area, in a Republican district, that challenges the legitimacy that these dictators crave. Like Putin is humiliated when tens of thousands of Russians march against him, especially all these young kids, this new generation of Russians. Um, Putin is humiliated when some rich Russian rapper tries to put out a YouTube video praising Putin, and it becomes the most hated, the most disliked YouTube video on all of Russian YouTube. Like that's, that's the humiliation that really gets to them because it challenges their legitimacy. You have this currently going on in Belarus, where the more Lukashenko's riot cops brutalize the protesters, including women, including elderly women who are on the front lines of the Belarus mass mobilization, the more people come out the more people risk their lives, risk their freedom to, to stand up against this. And there's a great power there because it's showing the world that, that this dictator is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's really essential. Like mass mobilization in good times and in bad times is essential to, to freedom, to protecting the most vulnerable, to showing the world that none of this is okay. And within time, those movements grow electoral power and they grow, they grow progress because what you have through mass mobilization is that people find each other, people are strengthened, there's, there's solidarity, and all of that courage, all of that faith spreads, and it's very powerful, which is why dictators are terrified and, and do everything they can to try to stop it. Thank you for that clarity. I think that it's really important, and it's important to look, as you did, to other parts of the world and examples that we have on that power, on our power. Thanks for listening to Refuse Fascism. We want to hear from you. Share your thoughts, questions, ideas for topics or guests. Lend a skill. That's what Werner did, and it was awesome. We hope to do our first episode dedicated to your questions really soon. So send them in. 
Tweet me at Sam B. Goldman. Drop me a line at Samantha Goldman at refusefascism.org. Leave us a message by visiting anchor.fm forward slash refuse dash fascism and hitting the message button. Find us on Mastodon. See the link in the show notes. Want to support the show? It's simple. Show us some love by rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts or your listening platform of choice. And of course, follow, subscribe so you never miss an episode. Keep up all that amazing sharing and commenting on social media. You can also literally put it on your forehead with our Refuse Fascism beanie, available at refusefascism.org, and start the combo there. Chip in to support our pod and content creation to help people understand and act to stop the fascist threat. Whether you can give $3 or $30, it all makes a difference in producing and promoting this independent weekly podcast. Give today by visiting refusefascism.org and hitting that donate button. We're hoping to set up a Patreon soon, so send us your ideas, thoughts on what you'd like to see over on our Patreon. Thanks to Richie Marini, Lena Thorne, and Mark Tinkleman for helping produce this episode. Thanks to incredible volunteers, we have transcripts available for each episode. So be sure to visit refusefascism.org and sign up to get them in your inbox. We'll be back next Sunday. Until then, in the name of humanity, we refuse to accept a fascist America. <laughs>